Good day to you all. I am the Mouse Master. I bring to you now the start of a new Squazg series. My second series overall, though my first was done for a different channel. Link in the description for anyone who wants to see my rookie entry into YouTube. What is a Squazg? It's a semi-commentary, campaign walkthrough, and strategy guide. Strategy guide because unlike a normal Let's Play, I will not just be showing you the game footage, but also explaining the hows and whys that go into the decision making. Campaign walkthroughs so that anyone who is having trouble can have a resource to assist them with their own game. Semi-commentary is just the way I do things. On YouTube, the two main types of game videos are either no commentary, which doesn't go well when one is trying to explain game mechanics and decision making, or constant commentary, which, to be done well, requires near constant and engaging communication even when nothing is really happening, which has never really been my strong suit. So instead, I break down the episodes into strategy portions, where I speak to the plan of action for the following video, and action sections, where I play through the game as a, say, proof of concept that the strategy I spoke of actually works. It would make a lame strategy guide if it didn't actually succeed in completing the game after all. The action parts aren't totally silent from me. I will both enunciate game mechanics as they happen on screen, as well as add the occasional semi-sarcastic commentary. As the series progresses, the game mechanics interjections will become less frequent as there is no need to repeat what is already known. So if you guys like the video but not my voice, good news, you'll probably tend to hear it less as the videos come out. Also, I'll say up front three things I will adhere to for this series for the audience edification. One, I will not be engaging in any political commentary. I will happily discuss my video making techniques, the strategy in the game, I will be reading the text in-game, and maybe I'll even make some of my in-game commentary in a faux southern accent that, if I do decide to do it, I can almost guarantee will be absolutely terrible. However, this is neither the time nor place for a well-researched historical debate, let alone the type of debate that is frequently seen in YouTube comment sections. So regardless of whatever else of substance is in any comments to these videos, if it includes the various political reasons for the war, I will be ignoring it. Two, I will be playing this game mod-free. This is not because I hate modders or anything. Indeed, a lot of the information I will be giving you this series comes from one of the community's modders and prolific posters by the name of Pandakraut. His contribution has been vital to this and deserves mad respect for it. My decision to go mod-free is for two major reasons. The first is that, when I play most games, I play them as a personal challenge from the devs. While better UIs, bug fixes, and the like tend to vastly improve the game overall, the fact is, the base game is what the devs gave us, and as such, the base game is what I take up as the challenge the devs have given me to beat. And second, related to the first, is that I want this squask to be applicable to the game as delivered. Anyone who simply buys the game, installs the game, and plays the game will be in exactly the situation that this series is designed for. Three, I will be playing this game on the Brigadier General difficulty level, otherwise known as Medium. Again, this is for two reasons. First is that, much like modding, I like to play a game as a challenge that the devs give me. To that end, I usually interpret that medium is the game setting that they've agreed on, and the one they expect the most normal of the choices. The only times I tend to alter the difficulty of a game is if either the game difficulty is tied into the storyline, like, say, the NES port of Double Dragon 2, or if you didn't play on hard, your game ended before the last boss, or if the game's difficulty is either kicking my behind so hard I have no choice, or is such a ludicrous cakewalk that I have more difficulty microwaving oatmeal. Ultimate General Civil War falls into none of those categories. Second is that this is a guide designed to help you through the game, not be some sort of perfect score game bible. If you are struggling with the game and need help, it's here for you. If you want to try and prove your mettle as a master UGCW player, I leave that to you. Why mention all this? 
to give you a heads up to any reason you might not like this series. If you do not like that there will be no real-life political discussions, or you are unhappy that you will not be seeing mods used, or if you are the type of person who doesn't like watching a game that isn't on the absolute hardest setting, then there is a good chance you will not like this series. Feel free to not like, not subscribe, not comment, and not notify. That is your right as an entertainment seeker, and I won't think any less of anyone for it. For everyone else, I present to you Ultimate General Civil War, played on the side of the CSA. And one other thing. As of me recording this, my personal YouTube channel only has four subscribers. One is someone from the Warzone 2100 series who wants to see what else I can do, and the other three appear to be channels dedicated to cute animal videos. So to cater to my majority, here's a picture of my mother's pets. Gotta know your audience. You have always dreamed of becoming a military officer like your father. You feel it is your destiny to serve your nation, earning glory with honor on the battlefield. Then we get a few choices to determine our background and therefore our starting skills. Tactician. You have graduated from West Point specializing in tactics, learning that reconnaissance is the key to an effective flanking maneuver. Strategist. You have graduated West Point specializing in strategy, learning that hard training is crucial for an effective army. Logistician. You have graduated from West Point specializing in logistics, learning that a war cannot be won without a proper supply chain. I will be picking Tactician for the plus one reconnaissance. Artillery. You served as an artillery officer in the Northern Mexico Campaign. Your battery was positioned perfectly to anchor our defense at the Battle of Buena Vista. Infantry. You served as an infantry officer at the Battle of Monterey. You earned a great distinction for your role leading the assault upon the town. Cavalry. You served as a cavalry officer during Scott's invasion. Reconnoitering the road to Mexico City, you helped unmask and defeat Santa Ana's ambush at the Battle of Puebla. In reality, I'm more of an artillery man, but I'll be grabbing cavalry for the plus three reconnaissance. Business. After the war, you went into business. Making a lot of money, you also made many friends who will help keep your armies well supplied. Army. After the war, you remained in the army. Rising through the ranks, you became a general of militia in your home state. Politics. After the war, you entered politics. Your sterling reputation and skill at managing men helped you become a United States congressman. I'm going to grab the plus three politics here. As spoiled by the video title, this series will be played from the CSA side. Brigadier General difficulty it is. And lastly, my name. If you haven't heard about the legendary Civil War General the Mouse Master in your history books, it's because I haven't written them yet. As for my stats, I'll get into detail about them in the second video. Generally, your first assignment is to secure a small coastal fort at the bank of the Potomac River. Your vanguard must hurry up and eliminate the Union batteries while the fort is lightly guarded. The Federalists have been alerted and gather forces to block the river passage in front of you. Additionally, enemy regiments have been spotted marching along this road. Advance fast and gain ground before the fort is heavily reinforced or else your task will be much harder. The rest of your troops will join you in about half an hour. Note that that is half an hour game time. If you are playing at normal speed, the game time runs about 10 to 1 compression. A minute passes every real life 6 seconds. So that's the official write-up. Here's what's going to go down. Our starting army begins here. This portion of the river cannot be crossed, so we either need to ford the river here or cross the bridge here. The opposition is just as aware of this as we are and have placed small skirmish groups at these spots to nail us regardless of which of the two crossings we choose. So we are going to instead take a third option, this way. By keeping our troops hidden in the trees before moving across, the enemy won't be able to react and reach us in time to take advantage of the situation while we are in the water, with its near non-existent defensive value. After crossing, we'll leave a skirmish unit of our own in the woods to cover us from a flanking attack while we take care of important objective number one. The Union have two infantry brigades, roughly the same size as our two, moving in from here, trying to reach the fort. If they make it, we will be forced to attack a heavily defended area with near equal numbers and no artillery support on our side, which would be bad. So instead, we'll interdict their reinforcements around here. To get there in time, I'll have to give our troops the order to sprint the whole way, but even then, they should still arrive in position with half of their stamina meter intact, roughly. 
After the reinforcements are dealt with, our troops will be fairly exhausted, and the skirmishers we left to cover the rear will need some assistance too. Thankfully, the other half of our army will show up to support them. Our current troops will head over to the eastern coastline to recover, while the newly arrived forces will sweep whatever enemy forces they can as they join them there, and take a break for a game hour or so to recover. Assuming we've done the job to this point, the fort will only be staffed by a pair of four cannon batteries, one infantry brigade, and any skirmishers we didn't rout. We'll prepare the push up the undefended side, which should be the right side, the lone infantry tends to prefer the leftmost defensive position, and rush our entire force over them, trusting in our superior numbers, as well as the fact that we have a general following his troops to win the day. Note that the goal isn't just to win at all costs. Minimizing casualties where possible is a big thing in this game, so during the charge to the fort, we'll bait their cannons with a skirmish detachment to minimize losses. Alright team, time to shine. I was hoping to engage them from the woods while they were out in the open, but I guess them charging into my lines while I have them outnumbered, both in terms of total men and number of brigades, works too. In this game, while exchanging gunfire, three groups of 500 men and one group of 1500 men is about the same effect, things like flanking and terrain notwithstanding. When engaged in melee, the number of brigades involved also plays a major role, giving my four brigades a distinct advantage over their two. Having melee specialist cavalry in the mix, and the whole fight taking place inside my general's command range, doesn't hurt either. The Yankees seem determined to defend the fort. We've got reinforcements and supplies. Use them wisely, General. I will, thanks. First order of business, save that beleaguered skirmish team. Under normal circumstances, it doesn't matter what type of unit it is, how well trained or well equipped, sending it into melee with a force three times its size is a recipe for disaster. 
However, an enemy unit that is currently routed, like the one here, has its combat capability drastically reduced, and running it down with shock cavalry will cause disproportionate losses to them. With the two enemy reinforcement groups running for the hills, it's time to start heading to the main objective. I'll leave one infantry squad here to deal with the enemy that disappeared south, and move Hexamer's group, who I guess I should be calling Examer since he was hit earlier this fight, on the right side of the river in case the enemy group that fled north tries to make another push. For everyone else, it's time to start heading for the final push's rally point.
At this point, there is nothing left on the map except the fort's lone infantry, two cannon batteries, and any remaining skirmish groups. I'll prepare by placing a skirmish team of my own just ahead of my resting infantry brigades and just out of range of the enemy cannons. Rearm who I can, wait for all the infantry sitting on the coast to finish recovering stamina, and then head in with the incredibly bad luck, I mean incredibly brave, skirmish group leading the charge. It is a common tactic when charging an enemy position to have your teams stack on top of each other so that they will all arrive at the same moment. However, to do this, you need to individually select the brigades and give each one individual move orders. If you try to multi-select and give an order, this happens. While this effect of the UI is good when you want to have a number of groups form a cohesive line at their destination, it is counterproductive to a mass charge, necessitating micromanaging your attacking units. Not my strongest suit, but it is what it is. I divert one brigade of troops to occupy the fort's defenses here. This has the advantage of me gaining the fort's defensive bonus, which for this stage looks like this. However, it also has the disadvantage that all defenses in this game have a facing. This defensive bulwark faces this direction, which means the opposing forces firing at them from these directions are getting in flanking shots. So on the one hand, I get a bonus, but at the same time I'm getting a penalty, and in the end, this group is going to take a big hit for being the unfortunate brigade assigned to it. The point of the occupation, however, was to occupy the enemy infantry while all the rest of my troops made their way to the cannons. In retrospect, I should have had Exumer's skirmishers take that spot first, instead of sliding them in for the second round. In the end though, the plan works, as the cannons are all completely smashed, with the cavalry running down the few stragglers, and my infantry then turning and firing into the backs of the lone enemy infantry brigade.
Congratulations, you secured the fort. Yay! The fort has served our purposes for some time and has prevented enemy supply ships from passing this section of the river, but now the Union is on the offensive, ironclads approach to bombard us. Federal infantry has disembarked west of the fort and is moving to attack. We have called for help and more troops will be arriving shortly to support the defense. It is advised to deploy some skirmishers along the ridge west of the fort to delay the Yankee advance. We need to buy time for our fort's batteries to counterfire and disable the ironclads. General, hold your ground at all costs. We must prove today that the rebellion has a strong foundation and that we will fight for every inch of southern soil. <gasps> First up, a save game. Saving often is a good habit in many games, and UGCW is not known for being easy, so doubly so for this title. I recommend no less than a save at the start of every phase of a battle, and over different slots, in case you find the need to go back two or three phases to correct an issue you didn't even realize was a problem at the time. Also, this is a great place for me to pause the game while recording so I can check my phone. While the fort is a defensible position, the enemy is easily capable of doing to us what we did to them. Show up in larger numbers and rush straight down our throats. To help mitigate that level of focused attack, moving your army out to the also defensible terrain of these woods and this house will keep the enemy army more spread out as they engage you. Dense trees and housing is excellent defensive terrain. Since we will be in it, and the opposing forces largely won't, we can, with morale-boosting backup from a nearby general, maintain an equitable combat exchange despite being outnumbered. At least for a bit, until the enemy realizes their numerical advantage and charges, at which point a fighting retreat to the fort will be in order. As a side benefit, leaving the fort will prevent our infantry from taking splash damage from the backside. We finally got cannons of our own in here, but they immediately get to be occupied by angry enemy ships. The phase introduction said to have the cannons take the ships down, but that isn't strictly necessary. The more time your cannons fire at the ships, the less they will be supporting your infantry. I'll be focusing down the left vessel, but as soon as it sinks, I'll be redirecting my cannons to fire at the front lines. The promised reinforcements will show up here, in two separate waves. Said reinforcements will be exactly the same troops we had at the end of the first phase that aren't already present. First will arrive the cavalry, followed up by extra infantry and the supply wagon. The infantry will be needed to assist the fort, but the cavalry will have its own job of being an absolute boss in the back lines. Unlimbered cannons move slower than infantry at the best of times, and heading through rivers and trees will just exacerbate the difference. If timed well, we can have the cavalry sweep in after every single frontline unit has long passed the point where it can support the enemy artillery. However, to not tip our hand to the AI, we need to be sure our cavalry isn't spotted until it's time to strike. I'll also split a detachment from one of the brigades to occupy the Vision Church at the start and give some backup to the cavalry later on. Let's do this.
Sounds like some of the enemy infantry have already activated their charge. That's not going to do their stamina bar any favors. No plan ever goes perfectly. I manage to swing the cavalry into an undefended cannon battery and it messes them up, but sadly the second battery had already covered enough distance that I couldn't melee both of them at once, and despite how slowly it takes a cannon to spin, they do eventually make the turn, and at the short distance they are at, they end up being able to use canister shot. In the words of my cavalry brigade, ow. While it will be a while before the cannons can fire again, it behooves the cavalry to use that time to disengage from the other battery and head away before they finish. Also, we've spotted the enemy supply wagon, so that's always a good target. Back to the fort, and the enemy has finally decided to charge. Again. Given our outnumbered status, this would be a really bad time to actually get into melee, so it's time to start following the troops back into the fort. Time was bought, and our reinforcements are starting to show up now. While trying to fall back, the northernmost brigade took a few extra hits, putting it into a state of panic. As a unit's morale falls, it can start losing effectiveness in three steps. Around 40 to 50% morale, they will stop volley firing. Instead, the troops will start firing at will, which is far less effective, but at least you can still control the unit. Around 20%, the unit panics. Its icon will start flashing white, and you lose control of it. If morale bottoms out at 0%, the unit will rout and run at full speed directly away from what it perceives as the largest threat. Please note that these are not exact numbers, and can vary with the unit's morale skill, among other factors. To regain morale, the unit can do damage to another unit, and or wait for it to regain over time. Any unit within the circle of the core general will have a drastically sped up over time morale regain rate. So if you find, like I do here, yourself in a position that requires a boost to morale, swing the closest general over to help them out. Supply wagons cannot fire back at you, and they can be captured by your own forces. If you find one by itself, the best idea is to usually tell the unit that finds it to hold fire and move to it, so as to be taken by your side. As an added convenience, once it has been captured, the unit that captured it will cancel their hold fire orders, which is a nice bit of anti-micro. Thanks, devs!
Oh hey, the enemy general, who in UGCW has 60-something escorting cavalry and yet no attack value, has been cut off from all of his friends by our own cavalry. That's a shame. Speaking of a shame, the opposing force's northern flank charged all the way up to the fort's edge, and then stopped. Guess the combination of their reload meter, morale, and previously wasted stamina gauge got the better of them. That is a good lesson though, and not just about the stamina meter. If you are planning on charging a position, decide early on whether you wish to engage that position in melee. If so, activate the unit's hold fire command. Otherwise, if they cancel their charge for any reason, and their reload meter is full, then the unit will stop moving entirely as they line up to take a shot. In this case, doing so within feet of my own troops that are currently hiding behind the fort's wooden pickets, ready to return the favor and with artillery backup. In the words of my grandmother, they made a boo-boo. Giving the captured supply wagon the retreat command will cause it to head to the nearest map entry point and leave the battlefield. Map entry points are unmarked and defined by the devs on a map by map basis, so to prevent accidentally trying to retreat right through an enemy line, it's often best to figure out which edge of the screen the nearest retreat point is, move the retreating unit to that edge, and then issue the retreat command. As soon as the unit passes over the map boundary, the retreat will be complete. Captured supply wagons are a strategic decision. On the one hand, they are additional supply for your troops. On the other, any supply remaining inside said wagon at the end of the stage will be converted to cash your army can use. Much like a map's exit points, whether you use a captured supply wagon for bread or bullets will probably be a map by map decision. The enemy cannons have no southern guards and decided to set up in the middle of the river to bombard us. I can't think of any better time than this to bring around the skirmisher detachment to engage and help the cavalry finish them off. Another major tactical maneuver can be seen right here. As good as the AI is in this game to react to strategic developments, its tactical choices, specifically when deciding what any given unit will choose to fire at, can be best described as whatever is closest 95% of the time. I've specifically arranged my troops, compared to theirs, so that most enemy forces have, as their closest target, a unit that is in some form of heavy cover. This is a skill that you will need to have in the back of your mind for the entire game, to make sure that in all but the most extreme circumstances, whatever is being shot at on your side is being shot at through walls and trees. 
Ideally, you want to be in heavy cover while whoever you are exchanging fire with is in low cover like planes, or even better, no cover like rivers and bridges. But at the end of the day, maintaining your army, while winning the stage of course, is mostly preferable to high enemy casualties. Colonel got killed? This early in the campaign, that's not great. Still, it's the Civil War. Get used to this message. With all cannons gone, I'll move the detachment up to the edge of the forest to start squeezing the opposing infantry from behind. The cavalry, however, has taken far too much damage to continue to be used, while the exact equation that determines when units shatter or surrender has a lot of factors and is based on some random rolls, there is a minimum threshold, where if a unit falls below roughly a quarter of its starting size, it's done. As this cavalry started at 140 and is now down to 64, it's one bad infantry volley away from being eliminated entirely, and we don't want that. So out of the engagement area it is.
During the first phase, the timer still read 45 minutes, but as soon as the three objectives were met, the phase ended. This time, the timer went all the way to expiration, and the stage still isn't over, though I can end it when I want to. In any given stage, the objectives and the timer in the top right are not guaranteed to define what will actually win or lose the stage. Indeed, there isn't any easy way to know what exactly you do or do not need to do in any given stage within the game's UI. However, that's what a semi-commentary spoiler guide is for. I find out so that you don't have to. I finish off the central unit, but given that I'm still being shot at by one of the ships, I decide not to take the time to eliminate the last two brigades. Time to finish and win. For the rest of this series, I will end the video with the replenishment of my army, but the army organization screen deserves a video all to itself. So this time, I will just enjoy the stage victory music uninterrupted. My mother would approve, I'm sure. Thus ends the introductory video. The second video will be all about the army organization screen, and then I will proceed through every single battle, both storyline and optional. If you enjoyed this video, then by all means, do all the things that YouTube likes to it, and if not, then thanks for giving it a chance, and I hope you enjoy whatever you choose to watch instead. As this isn't my primary job, and my various John Maddening of the screen takes a while, I'm going to start by getting one of these videos out per week. Catch you in the next one.